Hello, welcome back to Broken to Fruitful. I'm Mike Morgan. Belief systems. Beliefs determine reality. Just come to believe that, that we are believers, followers of Jesus. It's what we do, it's what we are. It may be the most important thing that we do. Uh, as I said earlier, your, your experience is not going to exceed your beliefs. So we're going to look at how belief systems work, and we're going to look at specifically belief systems in terms of what do we believe, as I said, about healing and wholeness. So a belief system is a, is a set of principles or tenets that form the basis of some moral code by which you operate. You know, it's how you live your life. You, everybody has a belief system and they have a moral code that they follow. It's the way you think about God, it's the way you think about yourself, you think about life, you think about other people, how you, you typically interact with the world. What do you believe? Our belief systems have a lot to do with what we're able to receive from God. Like I said, it's very difficult for you to receive something that you don't think the Lord even wants you to have. So, you know, it's, it's important to kind of nail these things down to what, what your expectations and your beliefs really are. Specifically, if you, if you have a need, if you're hurting in some way in, in spirit, soul, or body, what do you think the Lord's attitude toward that is? There are all sorts of belief systems in the body about, about healing and wholeness, and we're gonna kind of tackle some of those. My conviction, again, is that the kingdom is all about healing and wholeness. I believe that the uh, kingdom of God I mean, is salvation for the entire person, your whole person. And Jesus didn't just come to you know, get us to heaven. That was a big part of it, it's the most important part of it, but he came to save us entire, he is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him. So I think he wants to save our spirits, of course. He wants to save our souls and sanctify us. We pretty much believe that. I think he wants to save my body too. I think when my body is not functioning right, that it's the Lord's inclination is to heal that. I think he wants to save my relationships. I think I, I want to have healthy relationships. One of my daily declarations is I prosper in all of my relationships. Okay, Jesus, it says he, uh, he continued and increased in favor with God and man. So he favor is, uh, is God's bless, his attitude of blessing toward us. And, and Jesus increased in this, in this area of favor, not only with his Father in heaven, but with other people as well. He had a good reputation. He got along with people well. So I think the Lord just wants to bless every aspect of my life. The older I get, the better God gets. <laughs> older I get, the better he... He's like, I had no idea you were that good. <laughs> uh, I didn't used to think all this. But, you know, this is a very positive message. And I think it's, it is good news that the gospel means... Gospel of the kingdom means healing for the whole person. Even to our finances. I believe that God wants to bless our finances. You know, I don't believe this hyper-prosperity doctrine that, you know, that you know, everybody's supposed to be rich, but I do feel like part of the kingdom, one aspect of the kingdom is abundance. It is a kingdom of abundance that God is well able to provide and meet our needs. And scarcity is not very God-glorifying, I don't think. So, uh, you know, I think that God wants to meet our needs and, and God wants to bless the totality of our lives. If you look at the record of the Gospels, if we zero in on this aspect of healing, you know, everybody who comes to Jesus in the Gospels gets healed. Every single one. The only time we see any exception to that at all is when Jesus goes to his hometown in Nazareth. They take offense to him because they know him after the flesh. They have a lot of unbelief. He still heals some people. He says all he can do is lay hands on a sick, few sick people and heal them. Most of us would be satisfied. You know, that's good. I'll take that. But that's far below the way Jesus <laughs> typically operated. You know, Jesus goes to the, you know, the Gerasene demoniac. This, this is someone who had you know, a legion of demons in him. He's so powerful. He can tear chains off. This guy is just heavily demonized. One encounter with Jesus and he's set free. I love these, these accounts in the Gospels of where people meet Jesus and how quickly 
he does something profound in their lives. Woman at the well. It's a great story. I love this one. John chapter 4. You know, this woman, you know, you know the story. You know, she's had five husbands. She's living with somebody else. She's really very, very needy. She has a conversation with Jesus, and, and he turns her into this New Testament evangelist in one city. How long does that conversation take? I timed it. I just read this in normal conversational tones, two minutes and 20 seconds. That's how long it takes for Jesus to transform somebody's life. So, gospel of the kingdom is healing for the whole person. So healed in every way, spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, every way. That is normative. This is what it's supposed to be. Now, why aren't more people healed? <laughs> be real about this. I mean, I, I, some people talk about this stuff and it's almost like an air of unreality about it. It's like they're pretending. I, I just can't go there, all right? When I'm praying for the sick, I will pray for somebody as best I know how, and I'll say, okay, what happened? Tell me, you know, are you any better? Did you feel anything? Did you sense anything? If they say no, I say, well, let's go again, you know, and I'm not, we're not done yet then. I want to see some results. We're supposed to see results. So why aren't more people healed? I think there's four basic reasons. One is our expectations are pretty low. Secondly, we are conditioned in unbelief by the world system. If you hear one of these testimonies I just told you, if someone just said that to you and told you about that and then it's your turn to talk and you just you don't have much time, what are you going to say? That's unbelievable. That is a very common response. Why do we say that? If you don't say that, well, that's incredible. Well, incredible means unbelievable. You know, in means not. Credible means believe. It's the same thing. We are conditioned. Our speech is saturated with unbelief. We, all of us here, probably, except, you know, most of us came up through, in, in American education system, we're trained in scientific method. If you can't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, feel it, it doesn't exist. It's a completely materialistic mindset that denies all spiritual realities. We believe that there is an unseen spiritual world that, if anything, is more real than this one because it's eternal and this one's going to pass away. So we are conditioned in unbelief and we kind of have to have some deprogramming going on. I think also we lack understanding. I talked about that a little bit before, that sometimes we're not really hitting the mark. It needs to be the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous person that avails much. And secondly, we're just out of practice. You know, the more you do this, the better you're going to get at it. Okay? Now, I know if I just, because you're probably kind of a typical group. You've had some bad experiences with this. You've had people that you've prayed for, that you believe for. Maybe you fasted and prayed and you didn't get healed. So your experience has fallen short of what I'm talking about. I have too. My experience has not come up with the scriptural record. What do we do about that? Do we judge the scriptures by our experience? No, we have to judge our experience by the scriptures, not the other way around. We honestly look at this and say, my experience has fallen short of this standard that I see, the truth that I see that doesn't negate the truth at all. It just means that I haven't experienced all of it yet. Okay, there's plenty of truth in the scripture. There's plenty of the gospel of the kingdom that I have not experienced. Just because I have an experience doesn't make it's not true. It just means I need to grow in my experience. I want my experience to come up to what the scriptures say. I don't have to drag the scriptures down and invalidate them and say, well, because I didn't see it happen, it must not be true. No, I just got some growing to do. If most of us talked about this, you know, if we're, you know, kind of a typical Bible-believing group of people, if we say, you know, is Jesus able to heal? Well, yeah, he's able to heal, but probably not right here, right now. But let's look at what the scriptures do say about this. Let's look at just, just the plain, unvarnished, what does the scriptural record say? There's about 100 healing verses in the Gospels and Acts. Matthew eight seventeen. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. 
This is a really good verse for people who are getting older because this infirmities means bodily weaknesses. You're not necessarily sick. It's just that, oh gosh, I've been sitting down for like two hours. I might be stiff, you know. He took away our infirmities. He took away our bodily weaknesses. So I, I had back problems for a long time, you know, lower back problems. And I was claiming this verse, you know, I'm, my back's better now. I'm glad to say that. But he took our infirmities and he carried away our diseases. Great verse. Okay, another one. Luke six nineteen, and all the people were trying to touch him, for power was coming from him and healing them all. Okay, very good. Matthew twelve fifteen. Somebody read that one. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all. Okay, these are some of these all verses where they come. It, the scripture explicitly says there's a crowd of people coming to Jesus for healing, and he heals them all. He said, well, okay, that's Jesus. We're not Jesus. Okay, acknowledge we're not Jesus. But it's important, and we're going to look at this when we look at the kingdom. We need to realize that what Jesus did in the Gospels, he did not do as the Son of God. He laid aside his privileges as the Son of God. And what he did, he did as a spirit-filled man. That's why he calls himself the Son of Man. Okay, so Jesus is our example there. First John Something says, he who says he belongs to him should walk or live out his life in the same manner that he walked. Okay, so Jesus truly is our example and the way he lived life is the way he's called us to live life. Let's see the apostles get into the act here though, in Acts 5, 16. Also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits and they were all So another all being healed. And there, there are many. This is just a little, real small sampling. Like I said, there's about 100 verses in the Gospel as an Acts that speak specifically of, of physical healing. This is so, this is representative. I, I think the Lord's Prayer is a good place to go to when you're trying to figure out what's normal. What, how's it supposed to be, okay? and. What is the pattern of the Lord's Prayer? In the first parts of it, Jesus is saying, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Now, so it presupposes that things on earth are not exactly the way that they're supposed to be, which is the, way, the reason Jesus came. But he said, Father, uh, you know, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. So Jesus' purpose is to bring heaven to earth to bring the kingdom of God or the rule of God to earth, to bring the will of God, the perfect will of God from heaven to earth. So the question we could ask, do you see any sick people in heaven? Do you think in, in heaven there's people walking around sick? Do they need doctors or hospitals? No, I think that, you know, most of us would say, well, that, no, that's silly. We, we don't think that at all. So if in the Lord's prayer, we're saying, Lord, let your kingdom come, let your domain, your rule come, from heaven to earth, let your will be done as it is done in heaven, let it be done on earth, then the Lord's will and his kingdom would assert no sicknesses, no diseases on earth. That's what Jesus is intending to bring about. That's part of his purpose. And as we pray the Lord's Prayer, that's what we're asking for. This is really kind of basic for me. So if you're approaching the Lord about healing, what is the Lord's will about this? I think what Jesus did then is probably what he wants to do now. Does that kind of make sense? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Okay. You talk about it like this, it makes it pretty obvious. <laughs> so I think this is important for us to really settle in our hearts because again, there are, there are in the body of Christ, there's all sorts of different belief systems about wholeness and healing. So, but again, you know, it's really important to settle this in our hearts. So, like I said, I had somebody I talked to recently, really good believer, you know, they're sick and I wonder what God's trying to teach me through this. I said, well, the Lord can teach you something in a lot of different ways. He doesn't have to make you sick. So I don't really think this came from him. You know, you can open the Bible and, and the, the Lord can teach you through just somebody speaking to you in a much more benign, positive fashion. Like if you think about it, the way we attribute some things to God, it's almost like we, if we did it, we'd be accused of child neglect or, or abuse. I heard uh, Joseph Prince talked about this and he said, 
his daughter Jessica tended, had a tendency that she, she would run out in the road and they had to stop her a couple of times. He said, so the way some Christians are approached this is, here, come lie down in the street. I'm going to drive my car over your legs and teach you a lesson. So really, that, that's, it's, it's absurd when you, when you talk about it that way, but some of our thinking is almost that bad in the way that we attribute to God these you know, terrible things that he would do in order just so that we could grow spiritually. Okay, but I think God is better than that. God is much better than that. So this is important to settle this in our hearts that healing and wholeness is God's will. Excuse me, but do you yeah. think that God uses circumstances to teach us things though? I mean, there are things that we go through that right, make you stronger, so. I do think that's true. Okay. Yeah, I do, I do think, I, I, I kind of draw the line at some things as just being too extreme. Right. I, you know, I don't think God gives us COVID to teach us a lesson, okay? And so I don't think typically sickness, I don't think the Lord is the origin of sickness and illness. I, I think the thief is, you know? Again, I go back to John 10. Is this stealing, killing, destroying, or is this abundant life? There, I, I believe God disciplines me. I mean, it's definitely in the scriptures that we, we endure discipline as sons, and that's a good thing. You know, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So I've been disciplined by the Lord, knew it was the Lord's discipline, and was comforted by it. And says, okay, I was straying a little bit here. I needed, I needed the Lord to, to exercise some authority over me and show me, you know, bring me back in. And that's, that's a good thing. That's a comforting thing. That's very different from, you know, I've got pneumonia and I'm in the hospital and I'm near death. I, I don't attribute that to, to the kingdom of God. I don't attribute that to the nature of God. I think, I think he's a better father than that and a wiser father than that. You all are bringing something up that points out something I wanted. This is a slide I just did today because I realized it's true. I'm an extremist about this and I will admit it, okay? I am an extremist about this. I, I, the things that I, I'm telling you, these are convictions that I hold and I believe the Lord has given me this role. I feel like I'm kind of a forerunner in this area because I feel like as I have here this pendulum, that the pendulum has swung too far in this other direction and we're far too tolerant of sickness and disease. We've almost kind of gotten used to it. And you know, we don't pursue it sometimes as aggressively as I think we need to. So I come in here telling you, sickness is of the devil. It's never supposed to be in the body of Christ. We're not gonna tolerate this stuff. And you know, what I'm doing is I'm pushing against this pendulum to try to get us back to a balance. If it were me, I'd probably push it too far the other way. But I feel like, you know, I'm taking this extreme view because I feel like we're out here and we, we need to come back to, a, a, you know, a better healthy balance where we're, you know, we're seeing healing and, and, and health and wholeness in the body of Christ, you know, but we're not bound by any extreme views. This is my conviction, all right? And I feel like I need to have this conviction in order to convey the message that the God has given me. I need you to take it and make it your own. You need to come to a, a you know, uh, what do the scriptures say? How do they, uh, what do they say to you? Jesus said this to the people that heard him. Take what I'm proclaiming to you tonight, which I think there's a lot of truth in this, but make it your own. Something that you can live with and be comfortable with. I told another brother, a friend of mine, says, that, you know, I believe if, if, if I pray for the sick and they don't, they don't get healed, that's my fault. He said, Mike, this will crush you. Well, it hasn't so far. I'm still here. So I feel like I have a grace to bear this. And this is just the way I have to, I, I cannot come to any other conclusion. Looking at the scriptures and seeing what I see there, this is the only conclusion I can come to. I feel like everybody's supposed to get healed. I don't believe in any kind of selective healing. I do believe we need to go to the Lord and inquire for wisdom of how to approach something you know, in an effective way. But if somebody comes to me for healing, I don't have any question about whether or not God wants to heal them or not. It's just a question of whether can I believe for this? Can I allow the, God, the Holy Spirit to work through me in an effective way to meet their need? That's the only question that I have, okay? That works for me. It's comfortable for me because I'm an extremist, all right? But I think I've got grace to be an extremist like this. You take it and wear it the way it, it, it works for you. 
But he does still call people home. I mean, Jesus raised Lazarus. Well, yes, dead. there's a time to die, and we acknowledge but, that. But Lazarus All right, oh, look, but look. Lazarus. Okay, I gotta say this, though. Do we have time? Yeah, we do, okay. What's a normal Christian lifespan? You tell me. How long are you supposed to live? By the, according to the scriptures, how long are you supposed to live? What's normal? 70? 70 or 80? That's wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I'm picking on you. But, all right. Let me tell you why it's wrong. Okay? That's what most people say because it's in Psalm 90. You know, it's a portion to a man 70 years or 80 years if due to strength. Okay? Moses wrote that. He's writing it about the generation that fell in the wilderness. Prior to this, in Genesis chapter 6, before the law, the Lord proclaims the, the length of man's life shall be 120 years. This is before the law. This is what the Lord proclaims, okay? That's the only limitation that I see in the scripture. It's 120 years. I tell people, that's how, oh, gosh, no. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the only biblical limitation. Then you see the, the, many of the patriarchs exceed it. They live in the grace of God. Abraham lived 170 years. Isaac lived 175 years. You say, well, that's Hebrew years. It's only 360 days. Fine, take off 1.7% if you want. Jacob lived 137 years. We're going to look later when we look at spirit and soul. I think Jacob's an example of someone with a broken spirit. Even with a wounded spirit, he lived 137 years. He exceeded the 120 years that God said, this is the only limitation I'm going to put on you. You see, we are living below what the kingdom life really is. I am, I am absolutely convinced of that. So they didn't have process to lose. They didn't. There you go. So, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine uh, writes about these things, you know, digests a lot of books. There's a book called The Longevity Diet that I recently read that talked about there are some people groups that just based on the diet that they have, they typically live 100 to 110 years. It's very normal and they're active and vital past 100. So I don't think it's normal. We don't. We don't have to get old and feeble at 70, 80, 90, even 100 years. I think, you know, kingdom life is, is better than that. All right. I, I told you I was an extremist. So anyway. Okay. We've talked about declarations. We're about to finish up here and then do something really fun. Declarations are important. Now, we've talked about these things, and I think it's, it's, it's so helpful to take what we learned and say it out loud. A fuzzy, vague beliefs become crystal clear and definite when we speak them out loud. So I want us to make a biblical declaration, set the tone for the rest of our time together regarding healing, I have it here. God wants me healed and whole. When we ask for healing, everybody gets healed. Can we say this together? Ready? God wants me healed and whole. When we ask for healing, everybody gets healed. Great. Okay. If you found Broken to Fruitful helpful, I'd love to hear from you. To contact me or schedule a Broken to Fruitful seminar, visit the website, brokentofruitful.org, and click the contact link. My prayer for you is that you will find freedom in Jesus and joy in the journey. May God richly bless you. I'll see you in the next video.